In 1883, Krakatoa exploded, and in 1927, she gave birth to a Nat Krakatoa. A few months ago, that child of Krakatoa exploded. And that's exactly where we were anchored. Well, after a delicious dinner of barbecue Dorado, uh, I pretty much fell straight asleep. And in fact, last night I had one of the best night's sleep I've had in a very long time, which is kind of surprising really, considering our location. You'd have thought that we'd be on tenterhooks all night. But I did wake up at 4.30 in the morning to find that we were now sitting in 25 meters and not the 20 that we'd anchored in or even the sort of 14 that we'd settled in yesterday because we were settling into 14 meters we took up 10 meters so we only have 50 meters of chain down we're now in 25 meters it's only two times scope you know, there's no real strong winds at the moment uh, but the forecast is is rain today in fact Krakatoa is covered in cloud up there um, and Liz is now getting the anchor up so this is the question will the chain come up okay let's see and then we're going to anchor over that's another island just over there and maybe get a different perspective of a Nat Krakatoa. Well, happy to report that the anchor came up nicely. No problems there. Now we, so this is Anna Krakatoa. This is the active volcano. Uh, just down here is where we've just anchored and you can see we're coming up to another island called Kachil. And uh, the only hazard is there's, there's a rock here. We can actually see this fortunately and um, on the charts it's actually appearing where it's supposed to appear which is incredible occasionally the radar actually picks this up and it appears at that point so we're going to try and anchor down here and um, we've been told it's sandy bottom you can anchor in 10 to 15 meters good holding and hopefully it should offer a little bit of um, protection from that swell as well but of course the shape of this island has changed and that's one reason why the radar doesn't correlate to the shape because it's lost some of it. So it'll be interesting to see what kind of protection it offers when we get up there. Uh, we've still got swell coming through here and uh, we've got that um, afternoon breeze that comes through as well, which when we were down here, we were fully protected from. Well, we've changed anchorage and we're now anchored to the east of Anak Krakatoa. And uh, it's a bit rolly here, but in theory the anchor should be more secure um, because it's much the seabed's much flatter and it's supposed to be sand and mud. Now, what's interesting is this island, which you can't really see. The lighting today is terrible, really bad visibility. Um, but this is covered in stripped trees. There are one or two bits of green, but it looks like it's had a severe haircut. And when you compare this to the satellite image, the satellite image shows this island being completely green right down to the water's edge. You can see how much that has changed since the sat image was taken. So that's Jamie on his way over to Anak Krakatoa. He's determined to try and get some drone shots while we're here. Um, as you can see, it's very hazy today, so we're not sure how well they're gonna come out, but we're gonna give it a go. And as you can also see, is I'm back on the boat, I'm staying on Esca because this is really freaking me out. And I did not feel the need to actually go and stand on that very scary looking island. It also means that he's got the handheld VHF, I've got the main one here, so if anything were to happen at his end or my end, we can contact each other immediately. I can bring the hook up and get out of here fast and meet him. So, I wonder what kind of footage he's going to bring back. This is Anak Krakatoa, child of Krakatoa. Possibly one of the most dangerous forces of nature known to man. And we're anchored just over there.
you. I am absolutely buzzing. I finally made it onto Anak Krakatoa. So from the second anchorage that we've just uh, anchored up at, it's only a mile to the shore. And on this west side, there is less swell, um, much easier to land the dinghy. So I have finally made it. And first impressions is uh, the black sand, completely black sand. So the watercolor changes from a deep blue to a, an aquamarine and then eventually to black as you beach the dinghy and the breaking waves are just uh, in black and white. And then all across the, uh, the waterline here is uh, pumice. And uh, we noticed this when we first came in yesterday, lots and lots of floating pumice. I'm gonna pick up some samples for my nieces and uh, nephews. And we uh, noticed this as we came in and there obviously it's, it's pieces of lava. And as I pulled the dinghy through, uh, there was a, a floating patch of pumice and you can hear it hit the aluminium bottom doo -doo 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 -doo, like this. So um, anyway, what else can I say about it really? It's like a lunar landscape. I think that's a pretty obvious comparison, but that is the only way to describe it. And you can see where the lava flow has stopped. There's a, a defined line, I guess, where the water comes up, where the lava met the water and it stopped flowing. But it's literally, uh, they're cut off, each sort of flow has cut off like this. And it's created these funny triangle shaped roofs at the top of each flow, all the way along this side of the island. Uh, traditionally, uh, there was a ranger station just on the southwest, southeast corner and uh, we had day tripper boats coming in and of course this was uh, covered in greenery and people would come along, come to the ranger station and some adventurous people would walk up to the top to get that view. But of course uh, all of that's gone now since the last eruption only a few months ago. So now there is nothing there at all, uh, no sign of any day tripper boats and um, so the opportunity to see that crater has kind of gone for a lot of people but to be able to send the drone up and just have a peek over the top and to look down inside it's very exciting and i remember as far as i understand half of that western side of anak krakatoa was lost on the last eruption because what we see now is very different to what we see on the satellite image so it's pretty much lost one side of the volcano but that crater full of seawater and there seems to be lots of activity. I couldn't really tell whether it was steam coming out or if it was just frothing water from the movement of water. Uh, but uh, just to look down, get that perspective is, uh, oh, gets my heart pumping. I've done some stupid things in my time, that's for sure. But landing the dinghy on one of the world's most active volcanoes, that's got to take some beating. Well, it's only just over a mile away, but I tell you what, well, he has been away for uh, about an hour and it's felt like a day. So glad to have him back. Sun's up, anchor's up, and we're off. So it's time to say goodbye to Anna Krakatau and Mama Krakatau herself, and a funny little fishing boat that kept appearing in the bay. Well, appeared twice in the bay. And we just saw a sailboat come straight through the middle here. First sailboat we've seen in weeks and weeks and weeks. It was a charter boat. Probably surfers because they had surfboards on board. And um, we're now going to the Sunda Strait, which is the bit of water that runs in between Sumatra and Java. We're on a spring tide at the moment. I think it's a full moon today or tomorrow, so uh, it'll be interesting to see how the tides fare. I know there's rip tides at the top end of the Sunda Strait, so uh, we could be doing two and a half knots or we could be doing six knots. We've had two days and two nights at Anak Krakatoa and the surrounding islands, uh, but now we're heading off. We're going towards Jakarta. 
Um, we have a rough idea of where we're going to anchor, but we're going to scope it when we get there. So, leaving Krakatoa, how do I feel? I feel exhilarated and relieved, I think, jointly. It was the most intense and terrifying and exciting place I think I've ever anchored. So, yeah, the adrenaline is just starting to go now as we leave it behind us. So. Krakatoa, thanks very much. Yesterday we decanted some more diesel into the tanks and we use a water and particle separator called Mr Funnel I think it is. I'm sure you're probably familiar with it. And two of the jerry cans had quite a bit of crap in it as you can see here. So this is the diesel that didn't go into the tanks obviously which I've saved and uh, we'll decant this into a spare diesel can and decant it at the marina. But you can see quite a lot of particles there. There's, uh, you can't really see much, but at the bottom of the bucket there, is some dark sediment. And the, uh, I'm hoping the Mr. Funnel has done a good job in keeping that out of our tanks, but uh, time will tell, of course. So we left Krakatau this morning and started to get the sails out, but unfortunately, it was just a little bit too tight. And then as we ventured into the Sunda Strait, uh, the wind has been pretty much on the nose. Anyway, we've now passed over from Krakatau to the tip of Java, which is the next island down from Sumatra. And the first thing that we've noticed is we're back in civilization. The VHF has been busy with lots of ships chatting, lots of targets on AIS. We've had to avoid a tug pulling a, a load of coal, a few ships passing up and down and lots of resorts. Right behind me, there's a big long stretch of beach with loads of resorts and golden sandy beaches. Just one problem, this beach runs due north to south and it means that it's completely exposed to the prevailing north northeasterly wind at the moment. That's the VHF again. So it means that coastline is completely exposed. So unfortunately, it's not really possible to anchor there um, so it, it would think it'd be a bit uncomfortable so our next option is to head up towards the tip of Java and the next bay where there is potentially some protection is actually a massive industrial estate with chimneys and factories and loads and loads of ships at anchor bit of a shame but uh, we hope to drop the hook and I don't know how do we celebrate being back in civilization Liz? well I think we're going to celebrate being in Java, aren't we? The first time ever with, yeah. with some champagne! <laughs> <laughs> Slow progress up the Sunda Strait. Uh, it's a spring tide, in fact, it's a full moon today. I don't know how much that has to do with it or whether this is normal because obviously it's where the two islands meet and there's a whole load of water coming through. But uh, we've seen our speed drop right down to less than two knots. Quite frustrating. Uh, we're back up to about three now and as you can see behind me it's a bit more industrious. We're now surrounded by lots of boats, two LPG boats we've just passed. Uh, plenty more on the AIS to negotiate to get to our eventual destination which is tucked behind Little Island. Uh, I think it's going to be quite busy there with smaller boats getting some shelter from this current and from the sea state although it's actually calmed down a little. It's not so bad now. Uh, I'm just desperate for that beer and in my mind we should be dropping the hook by now but uh, we've got another two hours to go. <laughs>
I find myself on a funny little island right next to Esperatanka, which is just over there. Uh, we're, <laughs> we're trying to find a beer. We want to come ashore for a sundowner. And uh, we've just tried one beach. It's the only beach that you can actually land the dinghy in because a lot of this area is built up with protected uh, brick walls because of tsunamis, obviously. Um, unfortunately, the beaches are really grotty. The water's grotty. There's so much crap in the water. It's a real shame. Beaches littered with shit. Um, it's just a general grotty feeling, but then I, it's not really surprising considering this is a huge industrial area. So I guess it's just local people making the most of what little beach they have. But this little island, um, it's got a few cafes on board, uh, on shore I should say. And Liz just uh, nipped ashore to see if they do beer and I think I know what the answer's going to be. It's the wrong answer. The answer is the wrong answer. There's no beer. They all laughed at me, but we all had a laugh when they realised what I wanted. It's just a series of little stalls selling the same old revolting sugary drinks and crisps. Yeah. So I think we'll go back to the boat for a beer. We'll have our own sundown. Yeah, you know, this could be really, really nice. It could be. If we took the tyres off the beach and yeah. plastic, you know, it could be a lovely little spot. Shame. It is. These guys are happy, so that's all that matters. We're done with the island, we're going to go back to Esper, but we thought we'd just check out this little anchorage. We've got huge, great big tankers all the way down that way. And then over here you've got the more local boats, fishing boats, lots of ferries running backwards and forwards. Um, these rather splendid, uh, we guess they're squid boats because they've got lots of lights on them. And you can see the massive outriggers on them which they use to drop the nets in over one side of the boat.
How big is your love? 